Professor Jayal and Professor Narlikar, all that I want to say in two sentences is that doing a PhD is largely about being passionate. Certainly we, we follow methods and we excel in methods, but it's largely about being inspired and passionate about something that you want to pursue. And creativity therefore comes with passion. And in order to nudge you in that direction, we thought that we will invite three speakers who in the last leg of your doctoral work uh, will inspire you a little bit in that direction. And of course, there's also a final session where we have a bunch of very exciting speakers. So in that respect, we are very fortunate indeed that the Dean of my faculty, which is economics and social sciences at the University of Heidelberg and friend, Professor Aurel, Aurel Croissant has agreed to present his opening remarks on the study of politics and comparative politics in Germany, an authority on civil military re relations, democratization, and a variety of very important topics in comparative politics. He edits the very well-known journal, Democratization. He has numerous, almost publications that I cannot count, but just I want to highlight the most recent book that he co-edited, which is called Stateness and Democracy in East Asia, which was published by the Cambridge University Press. We are both concerned about democracy and the persistence and decline of democracy. And therefore I feel in a very collegial sort of way that uh, I have a partner uh, in that line of research who has agreed to inaugurate this session. Um, what must be said about Professor Crosso is that I have still not been able to figure out how, despite being the Dean, he publishes almost like as if he was on a sabbatical. Uh, but that should be inspiring for you all in the last leg of your doctoral work. Our second speaker will be Professor Nirja Gopal Jayal, who will be speaking on the reinvention of citizenship in the new India. Her book on citizenship, published a couple of years ago by Harvard University Press, to my mind, is probably the best book I have read by an Indian political scientist in a long time. It is not a wonder, therefore, that the book won the Ananda Kentish Kumaraswamy Award of the Association of Asian Studies. Professor Jayal spent her career teaching at the Center for Political Studies in JNU, where I too had the privilege of teaching. In addition, I also had the privilege of attending one of her classes when I was a student at the Jawaharlal Nehru University. Thereafter, she moved on to found the Center for the Study of Law and Governance at the Jawaharlal Nehru University. And in addition to being a professor at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, she's also a centennial professor at the Department of Gender Studies at the London School of Economics. <clears throat> professor Jayal's lecture will be followed by a lecture by another dear friend, and a very distinguished friend whom I just introduced, Professor Amrita Narlikar. Professor Narlikar too studied at the Jawaharlal Nehru University for a master's and then proceeded to Oxford for a DPhil in international relations. She was able to break the Oxbridge divide and became a reader in international political economy, as well as the founding director of the Center for Rising Powers at Cambridge before assuming the presidentship of the German Institute for Global and Area Studies. She is concurrently a professor at the University of Hamburg. Professor Nadlikar has argued persuasively in a field dominated by rational choice. That choice to a great extent depends on culture and tradition as well. Her most recent book, Poverty Narratives in International Trade was published by the Cambridge University Press. So our final lecture for today will be by Professor Narlikar, who will talk about foreign economic policies under Prime Minister Modi. 
May I now invite uh, Professor Crosson to give his opening remarks. Thanks so much, Raul. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good night, wherever you are. Um, on behalf of the Faculty of Economics and Social Sciences at Heidelberg University, I'm pleased to welcome you to Heidelberg, although it's only virtually. Because you cannot visit the town, you will have to take my word for it when I say that Heidelberg is one of the most romantic and beautiful cities in Germany, thanks to its picturesque riverside location, its beautiful old buildings and bridges, and the famous castle ruins that overlook the town center. And I sincerely hope that you one day will have a chance to come to Heidelberg when this pandemic is over. Heidelberg is also home to Roberto Carola, the oldest German university. The university was founded in 1386 and is one of the top three universities in Germany. And of course, we believe that we deserve the top rank, but our friends in Munich and Berlin may beg to differ. The Faculty of Economics and Social Sciences is one of currently 12 faculties at Heidelberg University. Founded in 2002 by merger of three institutes, it comprises the Alfred Weber Institute for Economics, the Max Weber Institute of Sociology, and the Institute of Political Science. In addition, other essential components of my faculty are the chairs of developmental economics and of political science at the South Asia Institute. The Max Weber Institute of Sociology obviously builds on a rich tradition of research, scholarship, and teaching. Its history began when Max Weber was appointed chair of national economy and public finance in the summer of 1897. From the time Max Weber lectured and wrote at Heidelberg to the present day, the Institute has been home to sociologists deeply committed to the development of the discipline, addressing fundamental questions about the social world and advancing theoretical understanding, empirical knowledge, and methodological skills. The Max Weber Institute takes an explicit cultural science orientation, which follows in the tradition of Max Weber. Structure, legitimation, and collapse of institutions in regard to sectoral, national, and transnational constellations take center stage. There's a special interest in the social welfare state from a comparative perspective, while another priority is on the discussion of theory. There's an interdisciplinary research department affiliated with the Institute that specializes in civil society, nonprofit research, and social innovation, the Center for Social Investment, CSI. The Alfred Weber Institute of Economics, named after the brother of Max Weber, Alfred, who joined the university in 1907, covers the central areas of economics with focuses on behavioral and public economics, political economy, labor and human capital, money and financing, and development and environmental economics. Development economics is closely connected to the South Asia Institute and the Research Center for Environmental Economics has been established for environmental economics research. Finally, my own department, the Institute of Political Science at Heidelberg University, is one of the oldest political science departments in Germany. Political scientists such as myself at Heidelberg University contribute to diverse research fields, but special attention is given to comparative research that cuts across the subdisciplines of political science. In respect to regional focus, the Institute primarily deals with Western democracies and with the comparative politics of the global South, in particular, Asia and the Pacific, or as it's called in recent days, days the Indo-Pacific. The three departments and our colleagues at the SAI, the South Asia Institute, closely collaborate in teaching and research. About 3,000 students are currently enrolled at the faculty with majoring in economics, political science, and sociology. Each year, the faculty rewards about 450 students with a bachelor's or master's degree, in addition, between 15 and 25 PhD theses are defended each year, 
and we have currently about 130 doctoral students in growth. With regard to research collaboration, in addition to individual research between researchers and research teams at the three departments, the faculty contributes in numerous ways to the university's more comprehensive research strategy. It is one of the core collaborators of the so-called field of focus self-regulation and regulation, which central aim is to better comprehend processes of human self-regulation at the individual and organizational levels through interdisciplinary dialogue. Through its participation in the field of focus, self-regulation and regulation, the faculty furthermore contributes to the flagship initiative, Transforming Cultural Heritage. Situated at the intersection of the humanities and social sciences, this research network investigates cultural heritages as an outcome of changing social negotiations. Turning now to the conference itself, I will leave it to Raoul to talk at length about the technical program. I will merely point out that this workshop is part of the Horizon 2020 program on Global India, an integrated training program that develops research skills along with complementary skills associated with an awareness for the needs of potential academic and non-academic employers. This workshop will provide young scholars with the opportunity to present their research to an international audience, engage in scholarly exchange on topics related to theory and methodology, and fine tune in the framework of their respective research projects. This event is obviously overshadowed by the COVID-19 pandemic, which brings enormous challenges and uncertainty to global academia and especially to junior or early career researchers. Universities suspended their academic activities, except for online courses for undergraduate and graduate students. Almost every country applies restrictions and sanctions to fight against the pandemic and protect the elderly population and people with chronic diseases, then they are categorized as risk groups. But the young population has to follow these restrictions and self-isolation to block spreading COVID-19. The pandemic has shuttered or reduced the output of academic labs and teams globally, slashed institutional budgets, and threatened the availability of grants, fellowships, and other doctoral or postdoctoral funding sources. That fallout adds up to a major challenge for junior researchers who were already scrabbling with limited funds, intense job competition, and career uncertainties. The vast majority of researchers were required to work from home and are still required to work from home, whilst universities and research institutions switched to online courses and exams. While the scenario in higher education is rapidly evolving, the impact of the pandemic on the life and work of doctoral students and other early career researchers is yet to be quantified. Earlier this year, the European Council of Doctoral Candidates and Junior Researchers identified several major concerns reflective of the many issues they are struggling with. One is that in the European Union, Doctoral candidates have to comply with a set of requirements to complete their doctorate and defend their thesis. In this exceptional time, some requirements have transformed doctoral training into an obstacle course. For example, doctoral candidates are sometimes required to complete a visiting period in another research institute, representing geographical or intersectoral mobility. This is impossible during lockdown, lockdown, and many doctoral candidates must reschedule or revisit their research plans. In operation, that's especially difficult for people near the end of their training. Even when all requirements are met, defending a thesis may not be easy. Some institutions and programs require an international committee to approve the thesis, and bureaucracy may complicate moving the final examinations online. Another obstacle or challenge is that in the switch towards remote working and online teaching, higher education institutions 
are focused on students and researchers holding permanent contracts, like, my, like myself, with doctoral candidates being sometimes left behind. Many remote working doctoral candidates highlighted a lack of interaction with supervisors and mentors with obvious effects on their work. Moreover, there's a widespread concern for a lack of training for supervisors to adapt to the post-pandemic or pandemic situation. And as being a supervisor myself, I must admit that such concern is not necessarily unjust. A third challenge is the problematic access to research resources. Many institutions quickly enabled remote working through technical and administrative solutions, but some resources remain difficult or impossible to access remotely. For example, there's a widespread concern among researchers about research activities which require access to non-digital libraries, blocked for months, obviously. Early career researchers working at precise physical locations may have to stop their work until proper health protocols are in place for their activities. And moreover, early career researchers working on data coming from field observations or interviews were severely impacted by the social distancing measures. Fourth, an adequate working environment is often lacking, especially for junior researchers. While many researchers may welcome the opportunity to work remotely, not all manage to switch smoothly to this new reality. Often working from home does not guarantee the same productivity of office. Spaces are frequently shared with other family members or are simply inadequate for work. And some early career researchers must divide their time between work and caring activities dedicated to children, elders, and relatives with health conditions. Lack of interaction and collaboration with colleagues is also a concern for remote working researchers. The lockdown has had a serious impact on early career researchers' mental health. Remote working has increased researchers' sense of isolation and high levels of anxiety related to fear of infection, possible layoffs in research institutions, and fewer career opportunities contribute to psychological turmoil. Related to this, for many researchers, the COVID-19 pandemic resulted in a decrease of productivity. For some of them, research came to a complete stop for several months. However, several funding bodies are not funding extensions and early career researchers are left with the only choice of working unpaid to finish their research. A decrease in productivity might also generate a gap among different generations of researchers and within the same generation. Finally, all the issues listed above impact some subgroups of early career researchers more than others. Remote working seems to have impacted more on female researchers reducing their productivity more than males. In the near future, personal or relative health conditions are going to prevent certain researchers to physically return to work, increasing once again the risk of discrimination in hiring and funding. However, even under these extreme circumstances, PhD students cannot simply stop with their research. The COVID-19 pandemic may suspend or slow down our works, but we should not let the situation hold our academic career. This time that you have now can be managed effectively by doing additional work for your research, like reading literature, designing new experiments, writing and analyzing data of previous experiments or field work, writing papers and widening our scientific horizon in our field. The academic journey of PhD or master students should not be held during this pandemic, since being a scientist is a lifelong journey. So believe me, the best is yet to come. The future of European early career researchers, your future, is the future of European research, our all future. 
and we cannot afford to lose a generation of them. I would like to close this welcome with a round of thanks to everyone who has made this workshop possible, especially, of course, Raoul and the team at the South Asia Institute. And I would like to thank our invited speakers for agreeing to take time out of their busy schedules to give up their perspectives on a broad ranging set of topics. I would also give a special thanks to our many junior researchers who participate in this workshop for presenting their work. I look forward to it. Once again, welcome to Heidelberg. Uh, thank you, Aurel. Uh, you've you've actually uh, given us a fairly graphic account of the geography, the splendor, the intellectual history, and a comprehensive account of the faculty uh, that resides in this great old German university. Moreover. Uh, you have not only mentioned to us how we are living in challenging times, but have also inspired us to not take a back seat and be remorseful, but to take the bull by the horns, as it were, and make our progress. And I hope that this will go down with all our younger scholars who will, who will get inspired that there are possibilities, there are problems, and we have to triumph over these problems. Uh, with these opening remarks, may I now uh, request Professor Nirja Jayal to deliver her lecture on the reinvention of citizenship in the new India. Thank you, Rahul, so very much uh, for the invitation and for that very generous introduction. Um, and thanks also to the South Asia Institute and to Dr. Himan Shujha for, the, for organizing this. Um, beginning with the protests against the Citizenship Amendment Act and all the way through the pandemic, this year has offered grim reminders of the multiple ways in which the project of citizenship, of universal equal citizenship in India is beleaguered. The scale and the intensity of the protests last winter are readily explained by the fact that the amendment speaks to a fundamental shift in the Indian conception of citizenship from the original conception rooted in civic nationalism to one animated by ethno-religious nationalism, the defining attribute of the new India. My focus today will be primarily on the Citizenship Amendment Act or the CAA, its clandestine prehistory, its relationship to the National Population Register and the National Register of Citizens and their collective implications for the Indian polity. By way of background, allow me to very quickly present a capsule account of the legal and constitutional history of citizenship in India for those who may not be familiar with it. As you are probably aware, legal citizenship has conventionally been defined in terms of two rival principles, you solely birth on the soil of the country or you sanguinous citizenship based on blood, descent or race, with the first being typically considered the more progressive of the two. But in practice, there has been increasing hybridization of these principles pretty much across the world. These two rival bases of citizenship were the subject of a contentious debate in India's Constituent Assembly as it debated the Articles on Citizenship in the aftermath of the partition, chiefly to provide for citizenship for Hindus and Sikhs fleeing to India from the newly created state of Pakistan, but also for those Muslims who had gone to Pakistan and later applied to return to India once the violence had abated. The Constituent Assembly expressed unambiguously its preference for birth, that is your soli, as what it called a modern, civilized, enlightened, democratic principle over the racial principle of your sanguinis as the primary means for the acquisition of citizenship. So in terms of what citizenship offered, the constitution provided for a universalist conception of equal citizenship to all, 
regardless of religion, race, caste, gender, etc. Clearly, both these dimensions, who is eligible for citizenship and what are the entitlements it guarantees, both are integral to the promise of citizenship and on both counts, the constitution adopted egalitarian and inclusive principles. Now, in a polity encompassing such staggering civilizational diversity, this was both a normative, but also a practical imperative. What tied it together was the idea of civic nationalism, uh, a sense of belonging, which transcended the multitudinous identities of cultural community. Having provided for the exigencies of citizenship in the extraordinary times of the partition, and having also provided the normative framework for citizenship in the new republic, the Constituent Assembly left it to Parliament to legislate on citizenship for ordinary times. And this it did in 1955, and it is the latest of a series of amendments to this statute called the Citizenship Amendment Act 2019, or the CAA in short, that has been at the center of controversy recently. Now, I don't know how much of an awareness I can presume of the broad contours of this debate, so I'll very quickly recapitulate it. The amendment essentially pertains to citizenship by naturalization for immigrants without proper papers, officially called illegal migrants, rather than the less humiliating standard term undocumented migrants. The antecedent law provided for such migrants to be eligible for citizenship by naturalization after a waiting period of 11 years. This amendment reduces that period to five years, but such fast track citizenship is offered not to all such migrants, but only to select groups among them, specifically Hindus, Sikhs, Christians, Buddhists, Jains and Parsis from three countries, Afghanistan, Bangladesh and Pakistan. The obvious exclusion of Muslims from this list of faiths, as well as the exclusion of Sri Lanka and Myanmar as neighboring countries from which migrants may and do come, has been officially justified by saying that the new law will only cover persecuted religious minorities in the three specified countries, who are therefore by virtue of that persecution deserving of India's compassion. Interestingly, the cutoff date in the law is December 31st, 2014, which would seem to suggest that all persecution ended on that date. But the implication is first, that only Muslim states are persecutors and their targets are people belonging only to these six faiths. And second, that non-Muslim Buddhist, for instance, states like Sri Lanka and Myanmar don't persecute anyone at all. As we all know, this flies in the face of the well-documented persecution of Ahmadiyyas in Pakistan, of Hazaras in Afghanistan, of the Rohingyas in Myanmar, and of Tamil Hindus in Sri Lanka. It also fails to account for why those who have suffered other forms of persecution, ethnic, racial, political, or indeed any other, should not be entitled to our compassion. Indeed, we are required to restrain our compassion from being intemperately extended this is a virtue that must scrupulously follow, like all virtues in the new India, follow the territorial and religious boundaries laid down by the law and respect the exclusions that are so entailed, however morally repugnant they may be. Now, the first and foremost concern about this amendment is the fact that it introduces an explicitly religious criterion into what was a religion neutral law. I'll come back to this point in a bit. But two previous amendments to the Citizenship Act, triggered by the political discontent around immigration in the Eastern state of Assam, had already eroded the use solely basis of Indian citizenship well before this amendment. The first of these amendments in 1986 inserted a new requirement. Until that time, a person born on Indian soil was entitled to citizenship by birth, regardless of her parentage. Now, in order to be a citizen by birth, a person born in India between 1987 and 2003 was required to have one parent who is an Indian citizen. An even more stringent requirement was introduced in 2003, effective 2004, making ineligible for citizenship by birth, 
a person born in India who has one parent who is an illegal migrant at the time of his or her birth. These amendments not only abandoned the use solely basis of citizenship that the founders of the Constitution and the Republic had put in place, they also introduced, albeit covertly, a religion-based exception to the principle. Because the term illegal migrant, which entered the law for the first time at this point, signaled the religious identity, namely the Muslim identity, of most of the migrants from Bangladesh against whom there had been such resentment in Assam. Simultaneously, an amendment to the citizenship rules excluded, quote, minority Hindus with Pakistani citizenship, unquote, from the definition of illegal migrants, thus legally destigmatizing Hindu migrants who had come into the border states of Western India, mainly Gujarat and Rajasthan, from Pakistan. What the 2019 amendment does is, it facilitates a pathway to citizenship by naturalization for such once illegal migrants from these three countries and promises citizenship by birth to their descendants so long as they are not Muslims. The statement of objects and reasons of the bill stated that this provision was meant to help religious minorities who were victims of persecution. But the text of the amended law nowhere mentions religious persecution and only the rules, which are by the way, yet to be formulated, only they will clarify if there's any requirement to establish persecution or any procedure to validate it, or indeed even to validate the religious identity of an individual. What the text of the law does say is that such persons will no longer be called illegal migrants. By implication, only Muslims will. The Supreme Court is yet to decide on whether this blatantly discriminatory provision violates Article 14, the right to equality, as also the principle of secularism, which has, pronounced, uh, which has been pronounced to be a part of the basic structure of the Constitution. What is evident is that entrenching the move from soil to blood as the basis of citizenship, the CAA implies a foundational shift in the conception of the Indian citizen. Such a shift, as I've indicated, had begun to occur, occur over the last few decades, but this law consolidates that earlier tendency in a definitively exclusionary way by openly introducing a religious category into a hitherto religion neutral law. The word openly is significant because there is a clandestine prehistory of exclusion, of similar exclusions preceding the CAA which actually went practically unnoticed. In 2015, the rules under the Passport Act and the orders under the Foreigners Act were amended to exempt the very same religious groups as the ones mentioned in the CAA from A, the requirement of holding valid passports and visas and B, exempting them from being prosecuted or deported on the same grounds that they were, quote, compelled to seek shelter in India due to religious persecution or fear of religious persecution, unquote. Now being rules or orders under the acts, these did not need parliamentary approval. They were simply inked in by the executive. In March, 2018, the Reserve Bank of India, India Central Bank, amended the regulations governing foreigners purchasing property in India, once again, relaxing requirements for the same groups from the same countries. This covert history of protective coverage being incrementally extended to the same groups from the same set of countries and the fact that it is paralleled by predictable exclusions is significant. But it must be emphasized that it is not the inclusions per se that are objectionable, but the exclusions that are entailed. The CAA thus opens up pathways to citizenship for favored groups of migrants deemed acceptable only on grounds of their faith and their countries of origin. It is complemented by another initiative, the National Register of Indian Citizens, or NRC for short, which opens up paths to statelessness for groups that are disfavored only on the basis of their faith. 
Together, the NRC and the CAA have the potential of transforming India into a majoritarian polity in which citizenship is based on faith with gradations of citizenship rights that undermine the constitutional principle of universal equal citizenship, potentially with privileges of inclusion being attached to some categories of citizens while others suffer the disabilities of exclusion. Let me explain how. The NRC and the National Population Register, which have both been on the statute books since 2003, um, uh, provide the answer to this. The National Population Register is just that, a register of usual residents, not of citizens, but of people who have lived in a particular area for a period of six months and who anticipate living in the same place for the next six months. When the NPR is compiled, it will be the prerogative of the local sub-registrar, an official of fairly modest status, to identify doubtful persons or to put down as doubtful persons that other non-doubtful persons in the locality identify as doubtful. The emergence and flourishing of a robust rent-seeking economy in the manufacture and certification papers can be realistically anticipated. Now, those who get authenticated through this process will appear on the National Register of Citizens. Those who remain doubtful will have to follow a process of trying to prove that they legally exist through appeals, first in the foreigners' tribunals and then through the courts. It is not very clear what precisely their doubtful status will involve as the adjudication of claims meanders slowly up from one level to another. But disenfranchisement, disqualification for government benefits would obviously be entailed. In the ultimate analysis, there is the horrific prospect of incarceration in detention centers for which generous financial provision has already been made. In Assam alone, the construction of a large detention camp with a capacity of 3000 detainees has begun with 10 others planned to fit a thousand people each. And there are uh, detention centers now all over the country uh, data on which is now uh, available. Deportation on a large scale may be unlikely, though, I, as I say this, I recognize that about 49 people were deported in the last two or three weeks, but large scale statelessness is certainly plausible. It could be objected that this concern that exclusions will be faith-based is unwarranted or exaggerated, because after all, this could arguably affect anyone who is undocumented. But that should push us to consider who the undocumented are, the poor, the marginalized, and the vulnerable. It is no secret that the social groups that overwhelmingly populate the ranks of the poor and marginalized are Dalits, Adivasis, and Muslims. This is why the repeated insistence on minding what has been called the chronology points to the path to citizenship that has, if you like, thoughtfully been made available in advance enabling you to declare your undocumented self as a member of a persecuted religious minority. The only section of people that does not have such recourse to the CAA is the Muslims. The rationale for a nationwide NRC, its feasibility, its costs, financial, logistical, administrative, but above all its moral legitimacy are questionable. But even were this morally unexceptionable, it is questionable if India has the state capacity required to accurately sift and sort citizens from non-citizens. As of today, nobody even knows which document is conclusive proof of citizenship. In February, the Guwahati High Court held that the election card is not proof of citizenship. Just a fortnight later, the Bombay High Court held that it is proof of citizenship and that the petitioners who had these cards were not illegal Bangladeshi migrants. While the limitations of administrative capacity in India are a public secret, this is clearly a nightmarish prospect for all poor and unlettered citizens who are unable to produce acceptable documentation. The phenomenon of paper citizenship acquired through what Kamal Sadiq has called networks of kinship and networks of profit is well known. As in Assam, an NRC could actually put undocumented nationals 
at risk of losing their citizenship in the futile search for non-national migrants who are invariably better documented. So its impact will fall most grievously on the undocumented poor who belong as emphatically as anyone else, but who could, for lack of documentation, be rendered stateless and incarcerated in detention centers. Already in the spring, the fear of not having papers had led to over 30 suicides in Assam, but also in Bengal. We should perhaps brace ourselves for more once the process restarts post pandemic. The minutiae of implementation are, however, only cautionary arguments. The most compelling arguments against this alphabet soup are four. First, India was constituted as a civic rather than a cultural community. The CAA in combination with the NRC and the NPR signals a transformative shift from a civic national conception to an ethno-national conception of India as a political community in which identity will determine gradations of citizenship. This is a slippery slope to a new conception of Indian nationhood itself, one that is defined in religious majoritarian terms. From a political perspective, it signifies a possibly tectonic shift from a civic national to an ethno-national conception of the political community and its terms of membership. From the perspective of India's social fabric, it signals an ominous fraying, unraveling of what was a daring and moderately successful experiment in making pluralism and diversity work within a democratic framework. Second, it threatens to diminish the already second-class citizenship of the Muslim minority. The Such a Committee Report 2006 had established the poor indicators of social and economic development for Indian Muslims, even worse than those of Dalits and Adivasis. Their political representation has always been disproportionately low, but it was until recently at least tokenistically accepted as desirable. In recent times, everyday practices of social discrimination in an ecosystem of violence, fear, and insecurity, from lynchings to triple talaq, the citizenship of the vast majority of Indian Muslims has been substantively second class. With this amendment to the law, even their formal citizenship is endangered. If the NRC results in disenfranchisement, it will only complete the political marginalization of Muslims. In the last few years, it has been repeatedly made clear that they are not deserving of representation. By potentially disenfranchising them, this could actually make them politically unrepresentable by law. Third, the gap between formal and substantive citizenship will widen, not just for Muslims, but for all poor and document poor Indians, including and especially Dalits and Adivasis. Given the marginalization and vulnerability of these groups, given the convergence between poverty and the absence of documents, given the histories of prejudice in our society, these groups more than others will become vulnerable even to the deprivation of their presently purely formal legal status of citizenship. This would be then a move from the substantively second-class citizenship they currently hold to formal legal second-class citizenship. Finally, those whose legal citizenship becomes suspect risk becoming aliens. Alienage may not lead to expulsion, but it can entail disenfranchisement and the comprehensive deprivation of civil and political rights including the right to own property. We need to be mindful of the dangers of statelessness because stripping people of citizenship is typically a prelude to stripping them of rights. And the cautionary words of Hannah Arendt on this, on how the condition of statelessness is a necessary prelude to rightlessness, never run truer. So the unholy trinity of the CAA, NPR, NRC threatens to convert legitimate citizens into illegal immigrants and illegal immigrants into stateless people, both destined for the camp. As the CAA selectively legalizes illegal migrants and as minorities are rendered second-class citizens by the insidious use of the law, India stands on the edge of a dangerous precipice where not only its constitutional values, but also its moral compass 
are at grave risk. It was this moral compass that was so emphatically invoked in the protests that began on December 15th, 2019. While the CAA was undoubtedly the immediate trigger for the protests, it was the clash between this amendment of barely a hundred words to an ordinary law, the clash between this and the constitutional values endangered by it that was so powerfully expressed in the protests as the protesters held aloft the constitution, portraits of Dr. Ambedkar, and performed collective readings of the preamble, reaffirming repeatedly the principles of equality and inclusion enshrined in this founding document of the Indian Republic. The central theme of the resistance in Shaheen Bagh and the many Shaheen Baghs across the country was nothing less than a defense of India's constitution and its founding ideals of equality, secularism, and democracy. The peg on which this multifaceted defense hung was the constitutional vision of who is or should be an Indian citizen and the constitutional guarantee of equality among citizens. Another constitutional value that was rescued and reinstated as legitimate in the public imagination was secularism, a defining principle of India's constitutional democracy that had been snidely discredited since the 1990s. Now, the vocal repudiation of religious majoritarianism and the confident assertion of the idea of secularism in the protests resurrected it from the dustbin of political incorrectness to which it had been consigned and restored it to its rightful place in popular discourse. Finally, the protests witnessed the repeated invocation and even the enactment of the idea of fraternity from the last few lines of the preamble. The idea that we should, through the constitution, resolve to promote fraternity, as the preamble says, assuring the dignity of the individual, is an idea that's attributed to Dr. Ambedkar, who held that liberty, equality, and fraternity formed a trinity in which the divorce of any one from the other would defeat the very purpose of democracy. And he said, and I quote him here, without fraternity, liberty would produce the supremacy of the few over the many. Without fraternity, liberty and equality could not become a natural course of things. It would require a constable to enforce them. Dr. Ambedkar's attachment to the idea of fraternity resonates with Hannah Arendt's argument that the natural place of fraternity is among the pariahs, the persecuted, the exploited, the humiliated. And indeed, the presence at Shaheen Bagh of so many people who had hitherto been what Arendt has called inner emigrants was a resounding affirmation of fraternity. There was gratifying irony in the fact that Muslim women, doubly disadvantaged by religious identity and gender, were in the front lines of both challenging majoritarianism and redefining gender norms. Only a few months earlier, passing a law to criminalize the triple talaq mode of divorce, the discourse of this majoritarian politics had adopted the language of protection of saving Muslim sisters from their husbands. Now the same Muslim sisters were being diminished with insinuations about the motives of their protests because they squarely confronted and challenged religious majoritarianism. In other words, the politics of divisiveness generated a politics of fraternity and solidarity. The politics of hyper-masculine cultural nationalism gave an impetus to the reclaiming, the re-articulation of a feminized civic nationalism. And whatever the future of citizenship may be, these seem to be normatively reassuring outcomes. I say seem to be, I'm not saying are, because of two sobering subsequent developments. And the first of these was the unleashing of systematic, organized, targeted violence in Northeast Delhi in February, which led to the loss of lives and properties disproportionately Muslim and the vandalization of places of worship. Then came the pandemic, providing a conven convenient cover for the arrests of once again, mostly Muslim activists who had been vocal in the protests against the CAA and continue to be imprisoned on grave charges of inciting the very violence of which they were the victims. The second was a pronouncement by the Supreme Court in October this year, that while democracy and dissent go hand in hand, quote, demonstrations expressing dissent have to be in designated places alone, unquote. 
It is notable that this judgment, which has been challenged, by the way, a couple of days ago, came six months after the protests had already ended due to the pandemic. And equally notable that the Apex Court has not yet found time for 12 months to hear the multiple petitions on the constitutionality of the CAA. In the meanwhile, the fate of the founding idea of Indian citizenship hangs in the balance, replete with the potential of creating categories of differentiated citizenship based on religious identity. This sadly is the quintessence of the new idea of India. Thank you very much. Uh, Nirja, I think uh, we are really privileged that you uh, hit at a foundational idea, uh, which is at the very core of the basic structure as well as the foundation of India. I can, I can remind myself of the multitude of ways in which uh, the founding father of the Indian nation, Mohandas Gandhi, actually kept arguing with Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Jinnah that these things will not happen. And therefore you should not worry about a certain number of things in the Indian Republic. And uh, sadly for Mohandas Gandhi and prophetically for Muhammad Ali Jinnah, I think those very things have come to inhabit the space that we uh, inhabit in India. And I think uh, you have succinctly, coherently underlined, I think, some of these major challenges for the future of the nation. Of course, what kind of a nation India will be uh, is difficult to predict, but uh, it is an old civilization. It has lived with considerable diversity. And uh, I am sure if we were to draw from India's own tradition, as many did, like Mohandas Gandhi and even Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, we will come to understand that the positions that you've taken in this lecture are very, very important uh, for understanding the identity of uh, the geographical, social, and cultural space that today is called India. So we will take some questions uh, after the two lectures, I thought, because I think I thought that the speakers should get their fair time. And I think, uh, Amrita is going to deliver the final lecture and she will be speaking on a topic that we are really very keen to know about, which is the foreign economic policies of Prime Minister Modi. The floor is yours, Amrita. Thank you very much, Rahul, um, for the very kind invitation. And thank you also, Himanshu, for inviting me to be a part of this. And it is a pleasure and an honor for me to join you all at the South Asia Institute. I hope when the pandemic is over, I can join you all in person sometime. And thank you also to Nirja for that very interesting presentation. Um, I'm going to take you all now to a different area, as Rao mentioned. I'm going to be talking about India's foreign economic policy under Modi. And I think the two presentations, Nirja's and mine, sort of complement each other uh, because those are the two big things that this uh, government has been associated with, right? The issue of nationalism and then the issue of economic reform. So I want to speak with you a little bit on, um, I want to share with you my ideas on how reformist has Modi's government been. And I'm going to focus specifically on negotiations and narratives of this government in the World Trade Organization. So let me just tell you my main argument first. So for all the complexities of India's politics, Prime Minister Narendra Modi seemed to have his economic path cut out for him. His Ache Din Aane Wale Hai campaign, Good Days Are Coming, which had won him a resounding election victory in 2014 for his first term, suggested that Modi's primary goal was growth and development for his country and people, and hence also an agenda of economic reform. Focusing 
specifically on India's negotiations in the context of the WTO, I find that India has continued to hold on to its former trade policy priorities and negotiation positions. Interestingly though, the same policy priorities and negotiation patterns that had not served India very well in the past may now no longer be a liability. And this is only in part a credit to the Modi administration per se. Rather, it is mainly due to the rise of the phenomenon of weaponized interdependence, which in turn legitimizes, sometimes even necessitates the securitization of foreign economic policy and more specifically trade politics. Taken in this changing context, and if it plays its cards right, India's historic and oft reviled caution in opening up its markets and reluctance to integrate in global value chains may yet allow the country to have at least the last rhetorical laugh. So there are four steps in my argument. First, I start off with a brief outline of the successes of Modi's economic policy and also the limitations. Second, I suggest that an overlooked but important explanation for the differential performance of Modi's economic policies lies in the field of narratives. I offer a brief theoretical overview of the concept and I posit that the most significant changes occurred in areas where the government constructed new and winning narratives. In the third step, I focus on Modi's foreign economic policy within the context of the World Trade Organization. And I compare it to previous eras where we see a remarkable set of continuities over the decades. And in the fourth step, I offer an explanation for the persistence of India's old trade narrative. And indeed, it's hardening in some cases. And I argue that the, a major factor lies in the international and regional context, typified by the phenomenon of weaponized interdependence that legitimizes old narratives of protectionism and strengthens them further. So first, the record. Modi came to power in 2014 and he did so amidst high expectations that he would be an agent of economic revival. And there were successes in the first term. The Modi government took on some challenging tasks, including the introduction of a goods and services tax, which was seen as too hot a potato by previous governments. The government set up 355 million Indians with bank accounts for the first time. Its Swachh Bharat Abhiyan had built close to 100 million toilets. Jan Arogya Yojana aimed for universal health care and had reached 1.8 million benefic beneficiaries by the end of Modi's first term. India's services sector leapfrogged ahead offering smooth and swift visa services, passport services for its own citizens, ease of digital payments for retail purposes, and so, and so on and so forth. And the promise of less government, more governance, which was there in the BJP's manifesto, also seemed to pay off in terms of India's improving attractiveness for investors. So after years of having occupied embarrassingly low ranks in the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index, India jumped up a remarkable 65 places under Modi's first term. That said, there were several misses and there were several failures. Demonetization produced massive disruption. Agriculture remains a particularly different, difficult area annual growth rate in the sector fell to less than 3% between 2014 and 2019. There is recognition that if India is to attain the high growth that it aspires to pre-COVID, before the COVID shock hit, productivity in a sector that occupies over 50% of its population will have to increase. 
Manufacturing is recognized as critical to growth, but it remains beset with problems ranging from antiquated labor laws and land acquisition laws. India's slowness to reform and modernize its agriculture sector, or indeed produce the necessary leaps in its manufacturing sector have been accompanied by considerable reserve in opening up its own market or accepting new commitments in the area of international trade, both at the regional and at the multilateral levels. India's characteristic suspicion of regional trade agreements has persisted and possibly deepened. So for example, the EU-India FTA negotiations were started in 2007 and they were suspended in 2013, prior even to Modi's arrival on the scene. And this skepticism then persisted in the Modi years. India's negotiations with New Zealand for an FTA had been launched in 2010. The last formal round of negotiations took place in 2015 with no conclusion. The Canada-India FTA negotiations also launched in 2010 have similarly been put on the back banner. India's skepticism on regional trade agreements has also been played out, you've seen this in the news recently, in the negotiations of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RECEP. 15 of the 16 parties have agreed to the deal. India has chosen to stay out. So the, eco the Economist in 2019, summarized India's position on multilateral trade with a short and damning verdict on the Modi government's rec record in the first term. And I quote, rather than promoting trade, it scrapped existing bilateral deals, raised tariffs, and sparred with the WTO. End of quote. So that's the record and it's mixed. It's very mixed. Let me come to my the second point of my argument, which is narratives in foreign economic policy. Now, many of the difficulties, many of the failures um, that I've just highlighted do relate to deep structural reform. And in that sense, they are perhaps to be expected. So you could argue, for example, that the federal system exacerbates the complexities of implementing the goods and services tax. You could argue that modernization of land acquisition laws and rationalization of small holdings comes loaded with histories of colonial and post-colonial deprivation. You could even argue that change in labor laws has been the bet noir for many previous governments as well. Improvements in infrastructure to facilitate a manufacturing boost and a second agricultural revolution are not going to happen overnight or even over a single term of an ambitious government. You could, you could argue all this, but foreign, but foreign economic policy and especially the politics of international trade could have, perhaps should have been different. We would expect a growth oriented government to use an organization like the World Trade Organization to readily embrace binding tariff commitments and thereby not only offer predictability to trading partners, but also lock in the reform process at home. Further, by working through an institution like the World Trade Organization, countries can secure the gains of unilateral trade liberalization that mainstream economists advocate, as well as gain access to the markets of others. This allows the mobilization of export-oriented interest groups and can help balance them out against import competing protectionist interest groups. A government pushing for reform can even use the cognate international organization to shift the blame for tough measures, such as the WTO and the mandatory protection of intellectual property rights that it requires from its members. In fact, that's not how the reform process has played out in India. Even while successfully bringing about some important policy changes, which have, which have had a positive impact on the economic lives of its people, 
the Modi government has not played the two-level game to its advantage. And while there are several explanations as to why the government has achieved success in some areas and not in others, an important and usually overlooked explanation is that of narratives. Narratives, and here I'm using the definition offered by Robert Chilla, uh, to the economist Robert Chilla, and he, he says, a narrative is a simple story or easily expressed explanation of events that many people want to bring up in conversation or on news or social media because it can be used to stimulate the concerns or emotions of others and or because it appears to advance self-interest. Narratives provide accessible explanations and legitimation for governments to carry out specific policies and to convince their electorates to abide by them. Now, in some sectors, Modi clearly marked out his terrain as an agent of transformation and developed a narrative accordingly. A nice example of this was in the area of climate change. In this issue area, Modi developed a powerful green narrative by appealing to India's ancient traditions. He thereby helped make mitigation and adaptation measures palatable at home, and also ensured that India could show unprecedented, unprecedented and constructive leadership in the negotiations over the Paris Agreement. On trade, things were different. The same man manifesto of the BJP which had showed so much economic ambition was also the manifesto that had promised to put India first. The narrative was not one of reduced protectionism. While paying attention to several important goals such as cutting red tapism, the manifesto st stated clearly, and I quote, we should no longer remain a market for the global industry. Rather, we should become a global manufacturing hub. A strong manufacturing center will not only bridge the demand supply gap leading to price stabilization, but also create millions of jobs and increase incomes for the working class. Above all, it will increase the revenue for government and lead to import substitution to bring down the import bill. And it is difficult not to see some clear protectionist strains in Modi's Make in India campaign, as others too have argued. Amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, Modi's narrative has taken an even more defensive and old fashioned turn. For instance, the Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan refers explicitly to self-reliance reminiscent of ideas of self-sufficiency that had been propagated by Jawaharlal Nehru. New narratives of infusing dynamism in certain aspects of the Indian economy, for example, by referring to economic freedom, are thus interestingly accompanied by alternative and older narratives of self-reliance and protectionism. And this latter type of alternative older narratives of self-reliance and protectionism, these types of narratives appear most explicitly in India's negotiation positions in the WTO. Which brings me to the third part of my argument, India in the World Trade Organization. Three general observations stand out in India's negotiation behavior in the WTO during the Modi era thus far. First, the narrative that India uses is a trade skeptic and defensive one. Often this narrative is framed in terms of powerlessness and victimhood, which sometimes, especially to external obs observers and, and India's negotiating counterparts, sits at odds with India's self-perception as a rising power and indeed the status accorded to it in the WTO. Second, the use of this narrative manifests itself also in India's negotiation strategy 
So India uses what negotiation analysts call mainly a distributive strategy in its negotiations, which involves tactics such as refusing to make any concessions, threatening to hold others' issues hostage, issuing threats and penalties, worsening the other's best alternative to negotiated agreement, BATNA. Integrative strategies, um, which represent the other end of the spectrum, strategies that involve attempts to widen the issue space and explore common solutions, strategies designed to expand rather than split the pie are not, so, are not used so frequently. And third, the same narrative also influences the company that India keeps in the WTO. So for all the pragmatism that its current foreign minister, Dr. Jayashankar has espoused in the trade context, we do not see a flexibility of coalitions and alliances. In keeping with tradition, India often works in coalitions of developing countries, sometimes even as a leading member of such coalitions, and thereby relies on the power of collective action as much as its individual leadership to advance its demands. So, let me just illustrate the convergence of all these three observations on the kinds of narratives that it uses, on the types of strategy, the distributive strategy that it uses, and the alliances, the coalitions that it forms. Let me show the convergence of these three observations in one area of bargaining in the WTO, special and differential treatment. Special and differential treatment, SDT, is an area that has long been a bone of contention between the global north and the global south. And especially some members of the global north versus some members of the global south. And while previous US administrations had also raised this issue, the Trump administration has sharpened critique of SDT in an unprecedented way. So in a submission to the WTO, the US argued last year, whether the WTO status quo approach to development stat status was sensible at its dawn, it makes no sense today in light of the vast changes in development and increasing heterogeneity amongst members. And then the US went on to call uh, for a new, for a reform of the system. And it argued that instead of allowing self-selection, which is the long-standing practice in the WTO and its predecessor, the GATT, the US proposed a new set of criteria whereby members could avail themselves of SDT. Many other developing countries have conceded on this. They've said, yes, maybe to keep the system going, uh, we do need to make some reforms to SDT, but India, on its own and in coalitions has fought against such attempts to redefine the terms of SDT qualification. So India's negotiation narrative points to the condition of its own poor, besides making a collective point. And in this, its narrative is starkly reminiscent of the narrative that it has used not only in the recent past, but also in the GATT. So for example, last year, in a statement of the WT to the WTO, India's ambassador pointed to the low per capita GDP of India and also the fact that it is home to 35.6% of the world's poor compared to 38% in all LDCs put together. And then the ambassador stated, and I quote, in view of this stark development divide, it would be grossly unfair and iniquitous if India were required to take the same obligations as developed countries. The evidence is on our side, even though the resources and rhetoric may not be." End of quote. Now this type of narrative has attracted great hostility, not only in the Trump era, but previously too, especially since India's inclusion in the BRICS grouping and its recognition as a rising economic power. And even as others such as Brazil, South Korea, Singapore have indicated their willingness to forego SDT, uh, 
India has persisted in holding on to its claim. Now, may, in making its demands for special and differential treatment, India has used a strict distributive strategy, describing SDT as a non-negotiable right for all developing members to bargain on the presumption that one's own demands can be non-negotiable in a WTO context is an extreme version of a distributive strategy. Also worth noting is that in making this argument, India makes the case for the entire collective of developing countries. And this means that it implicitly binds itself with China's cause which has also insisted on preserving its own right to exercise its special and differential status. In other places, its commitment to work with China on SDT has been explicit. For instance, it was a signatory to a joint proposal by 10 countries, which included China, where it made an impassioned plaidoyer for SDT. In doing this, India has allowed itself to get explicitly hyphenated with China, a country which is in fact considerably ahead of India um, in per capita terms and as a geostrategic rival, and is also the, has been the main target of the, this, this Trump administration's wrath. Were India to disassociate itself from China and argue the case for SDT, it might receive a friendlier hearing from the US and others. But at least publicly, India has not been clear. In fact, India has been, has been very careful to signal that it's not make, making any breaks with China in the WTO. Instead, it has preferred to attract the ire of the US and other developed countries rather than risk the unity of coalitions of the global South. So the use of a distributive strategy, collective action through coalitions of developing countries and a trade defensive narrative that emphasizes poverty and powerlessness that I just gave you with the example from special and differential treatment, this same, this, this, these, these, three, these three features can also be found in other key negotiation areas that form a part of the post Doha agenda, agriculture, e-commerce, fishery subsidies. And what's more is that we see a remarkable consistency in this negotiation pattern, not only in the years immediately preceding Modi, but going as far back as the GATT years. So now I come to the fourth and concluding part. So why do we see such a persistent pattern in this narrative in the WTO? Irrespective of changes in governments, parties, ideologies, and changes in its own power positions. And there are several explanations for such patterns, including bureaucratic politics, institutions, entrenched interests, colonial legacies, negotiation culture. And you all, we also have to recognize that sometimes these narratives have worked, these narratives of poverty and powerlessness have worked for India. For instance, via the launch of the Doha development agenda, for example, via the transformation of the so-called old quad into new groupings that have included Brazil, India, and other developing countries at the high table of WTO negotiations. But a key additional variable which needs to be taken into account is the phenomenon of weaponized interdependence. So contra the assumptions that had underpinned the post-war economic system, which associated growing economic integration with both prosperity and peace, Henry Farrell and Abe Newman, my colleagues in the US, have identified the phenomenon of weaponized interdependence. The global production of goods and services via integrated value chains, as per their argument, generates hierarchical economic networks. Farrell and Newman argue that states which hold political authority over network hubs and have domestic institutions that support certain types of strategies are able to weaponize these networks of interdependence to their advantage. By gathering or restricting information or economic flows through what they call panopticon and choke point effects, states located on network hubs can 
discover and exploit vulnerabilities, compel policy change, and deter unwanted actions. And while we have seen, we had seen these pernicious effects of weaponized interdependence play out intermittently in the recent past. For example, China's export controls on rare earth minerals. The COVID-19 pandemic drove home these risks with an unprecedented urgency when it has become clear that global supply chains, global health chains can be weaponized with life and death consequences. So India's narrative did not fundamentally change. It incorporated, what did change was the world. India incorporated a further reason for exercising greater restraint in market opening without abandoning its earlier arguments on protecting its own poor. In a world that is adapting to weaponized interdependence, India's narrative no longer looks quite as anachronistic as it used to. Recall, for instance, India's demands with reference to food security as part of the agriculture negotiations and the Doha negotiations. Now, as several countries besides India express similar concerns, for example, in relation to food security, health security, security of communications and infrastructure sectors, India's previous resistance to the old form of globalization now, now begins to look almost pioneering. So to conclude, India's narrative has not changed in the Modi era, contra what everybody had expected, all the hopefuls, all the liberal hopefuls had expected this to happen, it didn't. And this suggests the limitations of Modi's reformist agenda. But the world has changed so much that some of India's old narratives have acquired new relevance. And this generates several interesting policy implications, which I would be happy to discuss in Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amrita, for this. Uh, I'm, I'm sure this is a lecture that only you can give because I'm not sure that there are many other scholars who are following both policy and narratives. And you have a book on narratives, which I'm looking forward to reading soon. Um, it does strike me that uh, that uh, that India India was never really a very globalized country, even after 1991. Of course, the trade to GDP ratio went up from about 19 uh, odd percent or 15 odd percent to 50% of GDP, right? Uh, so there has been a transformation and uh, certainly the point can be made that India was always cautious. So that, 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 that part remains. But um, in comparison to the past, uh, you know, people like Professor Jagdish Bhagwati and Arvind Panagaria, who've actually been very supportive of Prime Minister Modi's economic policies otherwise, even they have come to criticize that uh, if you go back on the globalization game, forget about the narrative, are you giving up the possibility of global economic interdependence? I mean, the, the way of looking at this is that going back on globalization is the easiest thing for a government to do politically, right? Because even in 1991, uh, the business class really didn't want economic reforms. I have sort of documented it at great length in my book. I mean, this is not very well known. This was not a capitalist class driven reforms. The business class was very important substitution. And it was the state that nudged it with the help of the multilaterals to move and in a direction where after moving in that direction, the business class actually became much richer than it could ever be under the import substituting order. So, so in fact, the business class wanted to live and gain from fishing in a small pond and were not really inclined to move to a bigger river or a sea, which would open up its possibilities. But it was the state that nudged or even kind of nicely pushed the business class in that direction. And, 
and and today you know you have a a range of indian business a scale of indian business that is unimaginable uh, from the past so i wouldn't take questions i'm requesting people to uh, to put their questions on chat uh, because this is a webinar format but uh, while i look at the questions that are coming up i would request you to look at you know from from the pol from the perspective of a policy paradigm do you really see a shift going backwards which which satisfies more the domestic constituency rather than pushes uh, in the direction of growth uh, in a bold way where you really have, have to actually discipline capital rather than be led by uh, certain uh, certain interests that will clearly and surely sort of uh, try to uh, keep their fortresses intact and not take the risks that are required to make those leaps. So you may respond to this while I begin to collect questions on the chat. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Rahul. Um, yeah, absolutely. And with, uh, in, in what you've documented in your own work as well um, on the business class and the resistance of the business class, right, uh, to the reform measures then in 1991, uh, is a good point. I, I, the one additional point I would like to make now is that there is a difference in the whole Modi regime between being business friendly and between being market friendly. And this regime looks like it's business friendly, which doesn't mean that it's market friendly. And the expectation had been that it was going to be market friendly. And you do need market friendliness to get that, to get that growth, uh, to get that leapfrogging that we're looking for, for growth and then development. Um, so that's one point. Um, the, the second point that I will make is, um, uh, there are, do you also want me to pick up on a couple of these questions? Because there are some really nice questions. That yes, please do, please do. If you can already see the questions, please They're pick super up. insightful. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Let, me just, let me just try and address the ones um, uh, by, Okay, there's one from, uh, there's a really nice, there are three from Akhil and the first one is from Shaunak. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the two are a little bit, the two are linked. Let me ad address the ones by Shaunak and Akhil first. Um, Akhil, we, you have three, I won't be able to, I'm not gonna be as systematic as I'd like to be in the interest of time, okay? But I'm picking up on your general comment on security defense and the link to trade. And what I think you're asking here is, a, a, a very serious question on geoeconomics or weaponized interdependence. So what was the, what has been India's objection? One of the big objections has been China and China's domination in RCEP, right? And we can go into details on this. That RCEP is a very shallow agreement, right? So you could kind of go, it's like an old fashioned 20th century agreement. It deals with tariffs, uh, but it does because of China's already very dominant role in global value chains, it opens up the door for further integration via those global value chains. So it's not there now, but it could deepen China's hold in global value chains in the region. So that has been India's objection for a couple of years, right? So this is not new. So there was a lot of surprise and critique in the last few days that you must have seen on this, but that's not new. India has been saying this fairly consistently. Um, and this then links up to Akhil's question. There is, where well, you say can't help us ask, can't help but ask, would you like to hasten a guess as to if and when India would join RESAP? This really depends on how the, how the region evolves and the world evolves. I don't see it happening anytime soon because we're seeing two very different um, narratives and two very different strategies at work, right? Look at Australia, for example. Australia, which has been repeatedly expressing concerns about China in a variety of ways, including with reference to COVID, right? And they are, they, and you're seeing weaponized interdependence happening very clearly from the China side in relation to Australia, right? And there is recognition that you want to get decoupling, diversification, whatever you want to call it. Uh, that's on the one hand. And on the other hand, Australia is a part of RCEP, right? So you're seeing these two divergent trends at work and it depends on how these 
evolve. It also depends in my eyes in a very big way on what Europe does and what the US does, right? What are the, your, what negotiation analysts call BATNA, best alternative to negotiated agreement. The more alternatives a country like India has, the more likely it is that it will be able to stay out of reset. Now, let me hook up with a point that Rahul made, right? The temptation for a government to just pander uh, to domestic interests and not go for more globalization and get more deglobalization, less liberalization. And there is a very serious risk right now, right? And this is not only for India. We're seeing many countries turning inwards, and, you know, starting from the US, right? And, and so we have to be aware of that. And if that happens, as Rahul also mentioned, that there's been critique from Jagdish Bhagwati, there's been critique from Arvind Panagaria, there's been critique from others. If that happens, India risks reversing the 30 years of growth and development and poverty reduction that it has achieved. That will not be a good thing, yeah? But what, what I'm, the really big problem that I'm seeing is there is a bifurcation there is a siloization of these two areas, defense and economics, right? So the economists are very clear to say, ah, oh, yeah, don't give up on liberalization. Don't give up on it, right? And the defense guys, the security guys, the, the, the IR people are saying, hey, look at weaponized interdependence, look at geoeconomics, right? And because we're having the siloized debate, that's why we are seeing these two divergent trends that I referred to in my answer to Akhil. And the only way that, I mean, the only way one can tackle this in policy terms, but also in intellectual terms, is to recognize that the two are not siloized, right? Because post World War II, the assumption was, hey, you get increasing um, interdependence, you get prosperity, and then you get peace. But the structure of production has changed. And our multilateral institutions are not built for that, right? Our rules need to be updated. So in a way, we need to maybe think about a paradigm shift of governance and sort of an intellectual paradigm shift. Akhil says, indeed. Okay. Um, and then there's another uh, point that um, I saw about a very interesting point by Tan Tanvi. Um, yes. And Tanvir, right? Yes. Narratives are always hijacked by dominant ideology of the state and government. And here I would say the kinds of narratives that I'm looking at I would say that is not the case, right? Even in, the, even in the Modi case, you see very divergent narratives. For example, on trade, you see this real reluctance to open up the market. Uh, on climate change, and, and so open up the market and take on new forms of commitment. In climate change, you see a willingness to take on far greater commitments. Um, and to me, narratives are also, they're not, they're reflexive with ideology and with many other factors. But for me, they are a very important intermediary variable that can help even, that can help go on to shape ideologies. So, um, and, and bring in valuable, at least nuances in them. And so for me, it's never just narratives, right? I mean, a case, a case in point would be how India has used narratives of poverty and powerlessness in the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, to transform the WTO, right? This was an organization, along with other developing countries, it was an organization that refused to talk about development. You said development in the WTO, and they would go, oh, yeah, we don't talk about development, we talk about trade. You want to talk about development? Go to the World Bank. We don't want mission creep. We got a round that's called the Doha Development Agenda. That was very much a function of narratives, right? So I and I I will qualify all that I just said by by saying it depends also on the area that you're looking at, right? In my domain, international political economy, narratives play a very big role. Um, and the last one that I would think I will answer is there is a question by Shashwat also. I think. Okay. I, yeah. I, is that okay? May I? Okay. Yeah. Cool. I just don't want to like hijack all the time. I want to give Nirja a time. Yeah, to after this, we'll we'll just go over to Nirja. I, I'm enjoying your, your responses very much, Amrita, as much as I enjoyed your talk. I'm learning so much. So, so please, please do take all the time. I don't need very much time. 
That's very kind. But Nirja, you. you're you're looking at the questions that have been posted to you as well. That's right. That's right. I am. Yes. I am. Yeah. Thanks. That's why I said I don't need much time. <laughs> yeah. Um, given India's, do you see a stance in future climate debates? Again, now I think this was an interesting, this is to Tanvi Deshpande, right? Again, this is a really, really interesting question. I, all academics hate being asked questions about the future, but, I'll, but I'll, I'll put my neck out and try. And there's two things, right? One, we know there's a COVID shock, right? We don't know how, you know, we know that, and we know that mitigation adaptation measures cost they cost in the short term, they, even though they are very useful in the long term. And in the Chinese case, China has exploited the green, you know, sort of the sort of green technology uh, and I, within its own country, even though it's had the whole relocation of dirty industries in the BRI. Uh, but in within its own country, it's really shown that green technology can work. So India could try to do that and that would be good. Whether it will happen, I don't know for two reasons. One, the COVID shock, because these things cost, like I said. Um, it will also, it would be helpful again if there were useful alliances formed between like-minded states. For example, Germany is always talking the talk of green technology and aid and development. Wouldn't it be great if it increased its cooperation on these issues with India? One, um, but two, I thought it was very interesting how Modi, in fact, he did this in 2015. He made a trip to Germany. And that was the first time I saw him in a speech make a reference to um, don't lecture to us Indians about, um, about looking after the environment. Looking after the environment comes naturally to us. And then he cited ancient texts. And that I thought was very interesting because he was using tradition to try and shape a narrative about climate change mitigation and adaptation that was homegrown, right? And we do, and and we did see a change um, in India's own negotiating positions in the, the climate climate change negotiations. It didn't do this in the trade case at all, which relates to uh, the further point that Akhil is making there. Mm that India does have, uh, have a difficult historical trauma of the Uruguay round, but I mean, I have trade negotiator friends from India who go further back, right? And who talk about, it's sort of the deep-rooted suspicion of East India company and, and, and infiltration into politics via trade, right? That is also a trauma. Um, so it could, it, it's true, it could go further back. Um, but again, I think it's interesting how in the case of poverty reduction, Modi has been appealing to different groups, right? Because for narratives to really work, you can't just kind of go do the whole, this is good for everybody and so let's do it. And it will all help future generations. It doesn't work if you don't know what you're going to eat tomorrow, right? And you, it doesn't work if, um, if there are high levels of poverty in your country. Right? And so on poverty reduction, I think Modi has done some interesting things by appealing to specific groups and coming up with programs also for specific, uh, you know, targeting women and, and, and the role of women in the employment sector, for example, uh, talking about the informal sector, for example. And, um, and so if, but in trade, he hasn't done this. So again, I would say there is narratives can be very important shaping devices, right? They're an, in, they're an intermediary variable. They're not a, I don't see them as an independent variable, but an intermediary variable. And if you can shape those narratives, you can really bring about changes in outcomes, not only domestically, but also at the multilateral le level. So for example, weaponized interdependence, India could do a lot in changing the narrative. I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Amrita. Uh, Nirja, the floor is yours now. Thank you. Um, I was actually enjoying that very much. And I was hoping that Amrita would also deal with the uh, the vaccine issue that she was asked about. But maybe maybe there will be time, I think. Anyway, uh, so I have, I have three questions, two from Anish and one from Tanvir. Uh, and all of them are really about where the pushback can come from. 
uh, which is not surprising. That is what is on everyone's mind. Let me take Anisha's questions first, though they're asked later, because uh, uh, because those are more specific kind of uh, questions, whereas uh, Tanvir's question is broader and more conceptual as well. Um, so Anish, you asked whether the, what is the likelihood of the Supreme Court striking down the um, citizenship, um, likelihood of yeah, striking down the CAA. Um, if present and recent trends are any indication, uh, it is unlikely that the court would strike it down. But however, what would be important would be the judicial reasoning that is offered in a judgment of this kind, because that would uh, then open the door to a larger constitution bench of five judges or more, depending, I mean, one is assuming that it would be taken up by a two or three judge bench as and when it is heard. And then there would be a possibility of a, of a review petition or some such being taken to a constitution bench. So judicial reasoning is going to be the most important thing there. Um, the uh, outcome, I think, is unlikely to be cheering uh, but I don't even know where, what is the likely, I think the first question to ask is, what is the likelihood of the Supreme Court even hearing this? Because it's already a year since, um, since these petitions were filed. Um, the second part of your question is about what is my take on the view that India's federal structure can potentially act as an impediment to the implementation of the NPR. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of speculation about this for the last year or so. And uh, uh, I would like to believe the optimists who think that the federal structure can and will act as an impediment. For the present, it's the pandemic which has acted as, as, uh, as, um, as an impediment. Uh, uh, you know, that's sort of collateral benefit of a, of a terrible event, uh, so to speak. It is possible that, the, uh, that some states may resist, but the fact that it was piggybacking on the census enumeration, and we saw in the early days, uh, I think in March, when a few uh, in a few places in I think it was UP that the census enumerators went out. Uh, obviously, this is not not a state where where uh, the, the state government would have resisted this, but uh, people were actually their their um, fears about this process actually led them to come out, and they were extremely hostile and and attacked census enumerators in some places uh, simply out of fear of what the NPR. Uh, you know, would entail in terms of their uh, being, you know, on the National Register of Citizens or not. And uh, that, so what is an important question is whether the new questions that have been added to the NPR, which ask about fathers and mothers place of birth, and so on, whether those questions are in fact going to be asked or not, or whether it's going to be the old NPR. So a lot depends on what the questions are that will figure in the NPR once this restarts. So there's a lot of imponderables there, and one can hope that India's federal structure would act as an impediment. But, uh, but given the fact that more and more governments in the states are are being uh, one way or the other going over to the uh, to the BJP, um, uh, it's very hard to predict how much of an impediment, how serious an impediment it could actually be, or effective an impediment it could actually be. Uh, so, uh, so that is uh, to Anish. Uh, Tanvir's question is broader. He asks whether, um, to go out of the fascist juggernaut, is it possible to build a secular narrative? Does the contestation site need a shift from civil society to state? This is actually very intriguing uh, because the state is where it's uh, the, um, the non-secular narrative is in a sense emanating from. Um, so how, you know, within the state, where do we find such a site? And we see that all agencies of the state blurring the principle of the separation of powers, even including not just the executive and the legislature, which in a parliamentary system you would expect to be convergent, but even the judiciary uh, defying the principle of the separation of powers is acting as an executive judiciary. And that uh, makes it unlikely that you would find, uh, uh, find um, a space or a site within the state uh, for questioning, uh, questioning this kind of, um, non-secular uh, initiative. Um, the, I, I think, in other words, that to counter this juggernaut, like you said, uh, it is important to build a secular narrative and it's not going to, so, so one other alternative, sorry, it could come from uh, an alternative site which is related to the state though not a part of it is, uh, is of course uh, political parties, right? Political parties uh, and political parties have actually let the site down. Uh, quite a lot. Very few political parties have actually stood up loudly and uh, and and 
uh, and criticize this. So uh, if they if they believe that their electoral future depends upon pandering to majoritarian sentiment, then it is unlikely that we will see a pushback even from there. In other words, the pushback can only come from civil society, which is which is uh, which is why I suppose the greatest um, sort of targeting has been from the state of universities, civil society, intellectuals, and so on, because that is where the greater chance of a counter narrative uh, lies. Um, and I think that the that those who stand for a counter narrative are probably not proficient enough yet in exploiting um, the social media, in, um, in, in shaping opinion through the social media, um, in, um, you know, in, in spreading the word, let's say about something like digital literacy, hard though it is in, a, in an environment of so much digital, digital inequality and digital injustice. But the fact that the hate speech emanates from the social media indirectly sponsored uh, by political forces means that the counter also has to be at least partially conducted in the social media. But ultimately, there is no alternative except for grassroots mobilization. Without that, social media still appeals only to a small segment of people. Um, it is important to use things well, I mean, WhatsApp, of course, goes beyond uh, beyond Twitter and so on, uh, Twitter and Facebook. But to reach the widest possible audience, you have to be able to counteract fake news. You have to be able to make people digitally literate. You have to be able to make them uh, see the difference between what is true and what is not. But that is a very large task, and it's a task uh, that has been left too too late, perhaps. And and perhaps we don't even have really the infrastructure for it, digital and otherwise. So I don't know, I, as far as I can see, the, the pushback has to come from civil society, but, uh, uh, but the conditions within which civil society is to operate for such a push, pushback uh, remain, um, uh, remain underdeveloped. Nisha, can I just point you yeah, to a question that you may not have seen? Yeah, I haven't seen the last it is, it is, okay. Yeah, it's a question from Jay Shankar Prashad. Yeah. Who says, could you please comment on the changing nature of ideological changes in party politics? Oh, sorry, it's on the it's on the QA. Okay. Yeah. In uh, view of the citizens. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking at it. Uh, come changing nature of ideological changes in party politics. Uh, I I I I Jack and Jack and Jayshankar explain to me a little bit what the Ahmadmi I understand. But what does he mean by parties causing the cause of uh, espousing the cause of Dalits and Adivasis in terms of citizenship amendment? Uh, where, where, what is the changing nature? The, the, you know. Okay, let me let me try. Um, uh, try and understand what I can of it. Um, I don't know how much of this is ideological change. You know, the the fact remains that these amendments, uh, the the prior amendments, which came into effect on January the first, two thousand four, but were enacted in December two thousand three, are uh, amendments to the citizenship law. That is. Uh, are amendments that were passed by the then NDA government. And six months later, you had a UPA government that, that held power for 10 years. 10 years is a long time. But nobody thought fit to give attention to these changes that had been made. Uh, and uh, I think the Congress party at least, uh, and so I've gathered from conversations uh, lately, is that the Congress party actually woke up to this and initially thought, you know, how did this happen? Did this happen on our watch? And then realized that it did not happen on their watch, but that they had neglected this for 10 long years and not done anything to reverse this. But then if you go back further, 1986, the Assam Accord, uh, that is an accord signed by Rajiv Gandhi, the 1980, 1985 Accord, the 1986 amendments were brought about to honor the Assam Accord by, uh, by, by the then government. So essentially, uh, you know, no government, and it's partly the Assam question and the vexed quality of the Assam question that has prevented any government, even those who call themselves secular, from actually taking this bull by the horns, uh, to use a, a phrase that uh, Rahul used earlier. Um, in, in terms of the most recent citizenship amendment, Jay, um, uh, well, I mean, parties espousing the causes of the, I don't know who you are thinking of in terms of Adivasis, but uh, Chandrasekhar Azad certainly came out, uh, Mayavati did not. We know what the reasons are for the quiescence in general of the opposition parties, especially the smaller regional parties. 
uh, the enforcement agencies and so on, you know, the, the sort of letting loose of these. As far as the Aam Party is concerned, well, uh, you know, I think it has been well described as the B team of the BJP. So um, there's really very little to explain there. Um, there's one more question from Rob. Um, in other contexts, nationalism plays out as a tension between. Yeah, is it? A, I mean, I would, I, um, I would be delighted if it were a push-pull dynamics. Yes, you're absolutely right about other countries. I mean, Patrick Vale's book on uh, citizenship in France shows us how, uh, you know, from the um, late 18th century, uh, this push-pull thing has been happening up and down, has been happening over over centuries now. Um, the nature of citizenship and, and, and the laws of citizenship as well. Um, since ours is a much shorter, uh, shorter history of, um, of constitutionalism, um, I, I am not optimistic, let me put it this way, I am not optimistic that this could be a push and pull dynamic which may change unless the larger ecosystem changes. And the, when the larger ecosystem changes, that condition is required before any of this will happen, because the Assam question, parties have to be able to recognize. Um, right now, what you have, the CAA basically addresses the Western India, the Rajasthan, Gujarat, Punjab side of the question, and thinks that that is the solution to the entire question, assuming that on the Eastern border, what you have is a Muslim question. But the Assamese don't see it that way. For them, it's as much about language, ethnicity, as it is about religion, right? It's not only about religion at all. Uh, so, um, I mean, not entirely about religion. It's also substantially about language and uh, and Bengali ness. So, um, so yeah, I wish it were the case that you know one could look at this sort of longer, this long durée, as it were, of of a push pull dynamic. But uh, I think it's too easy to say. I'm I'm seeing it as unidirectional right now. Yeah, so, I think this is this is uh, this is actually turning out to be true, unfortunately for us. Because uh, I, tomorrow we have a public session where we will have uh, from Aruna Roy to Prashant Bhushan and then Suhas and also I will chip in with a little bit. Uh, what I find happening with civil society in India today is much worse than what is being portrayed in the print media and the electronic media. Oh yes, oh yes. Civil society has been at the receiving end of huge, I mean first it was only the, the human rights groups and the green advocacy groups. And now it is civil society across the board, including development NGOs and everything. And yeah. ground papers are under great pressure and have been for the last few years, but now even more. The FCRA rules have been tightened and uh, approvals are harder to get. So uh, yes, it is a very grim time for civil society. You're absolutely right. And I think Nirja has edited a book uh, with some civil society people, which, was, which is going to be published by Penguin, I, I saw. Uh, not that yet. Was last, that was last year. That was last year. Last was, year. I'm, I'm sort of behind Re date. Yeah. Reforming India. Yeah. Reforming yeah. That, India. that was that was uh, that was uh, preliminary to the 2019 general election. Yes, that it was. Yeah, yeah. I, I have to get a copy of it. Uh, now I think we will. We are running out of time, but there is one last question that Himanshu Jha has raised, which is about which which says, what about the legitimate social purpose of the state defining India's engagement with with the global order? Would Amrita, like, would you like to have uh, some brief comments about the relationship between narratives and what John Ruggi called legitimate social purpose? And do you see any interconnections? I think with that last comment, we will have to end because we have another session coming on for the students. Uh, and, uh, but floor is yours, Amrita. Okay, thank you. I sort of I discovered only later that there were questions also from Shashwat and him and uh, yes, and, also from Shashwat. Yes, yeah. Um, so briefly to also to Anish, uh, the whole GSP thing that was happening with the Trump administration. I mean, the Trump administration is also peculiar, right? I mean, it's sort of we can only it's 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 a long story. I'm happy to talk about it later on with you, but uh, that this is a, we can't just sort of go. This is all. India's path dependency that it was not able to break, right? Um, so uh, think about this in a very peculiar administration that might change. Uh, not everything that the administration brought to light was peculiar. Some of the things that they, the, criti the critique is correct, but GSP is an example of, uh, of the many problems of the Trump administration on trade, uh, a bad expression of them. 
then uh, Himanshu, the legitimate social purpose of the state. Um, and absolutely, I mean, this is exactly the discussion that we need to be having now, right? Uh, because there was this sort of hyper globalization neoliberal moment where trade was supposed to solve all problems and opening up economic opening, including to find to capital controls was supposed to solve all problems. We know that's not the case. Right. And so um, this, this, in, 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 this discussion needs to be happening. It needs to be happening, uh, taking into account multiple actors because, and here I would strongly re, uh, sort of uh, reinforce what Nirja was saying, because much of the discussion on trade happens in a Geneva bubble or a Brussels bubble, right? And even in a system, if we didn't have the problem of weaponized interdependence, we would have two other problems. One, um, there are issues of distribution of the gains of trade across countries, right? And, and, it's, and we've seen the scapegoating of the regime by Trump, but there are also some real problems on redistribution. And, and so at least we need to be rethinking the regime in terms of one where there is um, enough uh, that it encourages countries to rethink the, the social bargains that it sets up with its own people. That's one. And two, the other problem is of narratives because you can get like the most perfect reform of the system, but if you can't, exp if you can't make it clear to the person on the street how the system benefits them, we're not going to get legitimacy for it and we will always have populist voices winning, right? And, and there has been this hubris in technocratic circles where we just do not see this willingness to engage, right? On a consideration of what that narrative looks like, that redefined narrative and then the communication of that narrative. And then to uh, Shashwat's question very quickly, completely agree with you. In fact, a lot of the times it's underestimated uh, the role of, uh, the bureaucracy uh, in uh, in trade negotiations, right? And and so yes, but in the bureaucracy too, we see a siloization. And so what in terms of policy, what I would argue for is it we need more of a grand strategy. Um, and and can I just end on one slightly happier sure. note? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so one of the one of the th things about narratives, right, is that they are not static. Mm -hmm. They can be changed, they evolve, yeah? And at, in my book, what I found was you have narratives of tremendous empowerment, and that is to Tanvir, right? This the dominant ideology and the state. But you have had narratives in which the powerless have um, acquired tremendous power, right? But then the problem is that those narratives get misused. They get overused and misused. And so the narratives then cease to be useful to the powerless. But the main point there is that narratives change and narratives evolve. And for me, they are, um, they are more flexible. Uh, norms take longer to change. Narratives are more interesting as instruments of change. And in that sense, um, it is possible to bring about change even from a position of considerable weakness. And this I hope will apply to all that we're studying, what Rahul is studying, what Nirja is studying, what I'm studying, right? This narratives are, can be a call to action, right? Mm -hmm. And the more people you include, include in this and you build smart strategies with social media, the more you're able to use them. Thank you. Thank you, Amrita. Nirja, would you want to have some last words? No, 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 that's it. Thanks. Thanks very much. So I think, uh, I think uh, Aurel, Nirja and Amrita have put us on to a brilliant start. I hope, I, I can see that our Marie Curie fellows are becoming quite passionate. I think Aurel sort of, you know, raised the flag and said that, look, there is Corona, but we can't say no to the world. And then we have to be passionate about it. And uh, I think Amrita was right. I think Nirja's presentation sort of complemented. I think uh, Nirja is looking at uh, one of the fundamental questions I think that India has to confront as to what its nature is. It's not a question of being right or wrong. We know that when Nathuram Godse assassinated Mohandas Gandhi, he pretty much felt that he was doing something good. 
and that Gandhiji felt uh, otherwise. And he said, you know, partition will happen over my dead body. And it did happen over his dead body. So these are actually, uh, we are sort of uh, in a battlefield of ideas. I think we must remember that, uh, that another person who lived in Heidelberg and taught here, Friedrich Hegel, is, is very, very much uh, not to be forgotten. Uh, and I think ideas, norms, culture, I think, have a life of their own. And uh, perhaps often they do not have a material basis and or <laughs> we cannot uniquely find their material basis. And, 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 and Amrita's work also seems to be pointing in that direction because uh, she has a body of work that talks about the importance of culture. And now she is making these uh, arguments about the importance of narratives. And I, I cannot really make a very good comment because I, it is, the book is on my reading list. I have not read it. But from the manner in which the presentation was made, it seems to me that there is a relationship, as she said, between norms and narratives. So if you have you know, norms that undergird institutions, uh, they will produce narratives. On the other hand, I think Amrita is right that narratives have the character of being able to confront norms as well. So you may not actually get a, you know, from an alternative norm, you can probably have a counter narrative and that counter narrative could then, it's a little bit like the work of Martha Finomore and Catherine Sicking that uh, think about women's rights in, in the 18th century or the 17th century. And a lot of things that you think are absolutely essential human rights today would not be human rights in the 17th and the 18th centuries in the advanced, most developed countries of the world. But the manner in which those rights, uh, which must have emerged uh, through a certain kind of narrative, came to occupy the center space of what we consider to be decent and civilized today has become an established norm. And I think in relation to those narratives and in relation to their being able to confront certain norms, I think is very, very important as to what is the relationship between the state and society because uh, the state does, it seems to us, have a very, very important role to play, whether it is import substituting industrialization, whether it is secularism, whether it is democracy. Nowadays, a lot of people have begun to say that what would have happened if Nehru had not been the first prime minister of India. So uh, it is certainly true that the state is a very important player. And if there are things that we are ruining about today, it's also because we rue the fact that the state is very powerful. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the kind of relationship that social actors are able to make with respect to the state, and that may have a lot to do with the way in which the state wants to construct that relationship, is very, very important for the functioning of liberal democracy. And I think it's very important for the functioning of liber liberal democracy, not only in India and in the United States of America, but in any other country. So in Germany to get today, if we have, uh, if we have a certain kind of a balance, it has something to do with the way in, in which the state, have, which represents the people, has been able to represent itself. And I think it's very, very uh, wonderful that we have been able to get into uh, what Nirja would call the norm of secularism, which is being contested. What Amrita would call uh, the norm of globalization, embedded liberal or laissez-faire, whatever it might be, which is being contested. Uh, she has also pointed out that the contestations differ over issue areas that, you know, what India is doing in the area of trade negotiations looks very different from what it is doing in the area of climate change. And that probably points to the fact that ideas internal to the state are very, very important. So some of these narratives that are coming out, if we, if we, if we just concede that they're coming out of a Hindu nationalist ideology, perhaps within that, uh, uh, that ideology, which was also present at the time when Prime Minister Vajpayee was Prime Minister of India, and he had to contend with certain social forces in order to push with his finance ministers, the country in a somewhat different direction. Uh, 
also perhaps has this uh, legitimating idea of environment, which speaks to itself in a very different sort of way. In So I think it's very, very important now for us uh, to go back to ideas, to go back to culture, to go back to the roots of why these things are happening in terms of the manner in which they surface within states, within social actors outside the state and construct the interaction between state and society. So I think with those final words, I think Amrita wants to say something. It's just that I need to rush off for my next. Yeah, meeting. yeah. But so we, should, so we much. certainly will let you go now. And thank you all very much. Thank, thank you, you also for the attendees and the panelists for uh, making this such a wonderful session. Thank you all. And thanks very much, Rahul and Amrita. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks a ton. Nirja, it was wonderful to meet, to meet you. And I hope we can Love continue. To virtually at least. <laughs> yeah. so good luck, everybody. That was really stimulating. Bye. And thank you, Rahul. Bye. Rahul. Yeah, bye.